I'm not really interested in making money. I'm interested in creating things. And that's always been my, my, my reason for being. Entrepreneurs are what is fixing the world. What is a business? A business is simply somebody coming up with an idea to make other people's lives better. Once you've been able to build one entrepreneurial company, you can, you can build any, any numbers of entrepreneurial companies. It's really important to make people smile. People have got to enjoy what you're doing. It mustn't feel like a stunt. The, the more humor you can have, the better. I had to use myself to put the Virgin brand on the map. If somebody came to me and said, no one's crossed the Atlantic, in a hot air balloon before. Let's take it the next step. Hey, just a really quick note to say thank you so much to all of our new subscribers. And if you haven't yet subscribed, why not? It means you're the first to know about brand new episodes of High Performance. And it also means we can attract incredible new guests to the show. So please hit subscribe right now. Enjoy the show. Well, Richard, welcome to the show. Welcome to our lovely home here at Fora, overlooking London. Thank you very much for having us. I'd like to start by asking you, what do you believe high performance to be? Doing one's, doing one's best. I mean, I think uh, you can, one can't expect any, anything more than that from people. You know, some people are capable of doing more than others. Um, but as long as I think you've, you've, done, you've done your best, um, you, you've, you've performed as, as best you can. So uh, to me, that's what high performance is. I'd love to play a few clips from your from your new audio book, if that's okay. And I just want to talk about some of the sort of key moments in your life from those. So I want to start with one of my favorite stories from the book. Let's have a let's have a listen to this. When we landed, I was standing beside the plane trying to think of how to overcome this problem when a press photographer came up to me, smiling broadly. I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm not up to it right now. I'm sorry too, he said. I saw the flames of smoke pouring out of your engine. I actually got a great shot of it. He looked at my dumbstruck face and then said, don't worry, Richard, I'm from the Financial Times. We're not that kind of paper. And he opened up his camera, pulled out the film and gave it to me. I couldn't find words to thank him. If that photograph had appeared in the press, it would have been the end of Virgin Atlantic before we'd even begun. <laughs> yeah, so... Um... We'd got one plane, uh, this was 40 years ago uh, this year, um, and uh, one, one second-hand jumbo jet, and we'd had a test flight um, with um, the Civil Aviation Authority inspectors sitting next to me um, uh, the day before the inaugural, inaugural flight to fly to Newark. And as we took off, um, a bunch of uh, birds went into our engine, and there was this mighty bang and the plume of... Uh, of uh, red red flame went right along the side of the plane. The, the, the plane just carried on flying because it's got you know th three more engines, um, and uh, I went a bit white. And um, the CAA inspector just put his arm around me and said, "Don't worry, Richard. These things happen," and um, which was very reassuring. And all, all our staff were on board, and um, and and then when we landed, uh, yeah, the, 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 this incredible. A uh, photographer from the FT um, was good enough to destroy that bit of footage, which um, I will, I will for it forever remember. And uh, overnight, we managed to borrow the money to get another engine. Uh, the next day, Virgin Atlantic took off, and um, and you know we've had lots of struggles over the last um, forty years, um, but um, we're, we're still still going. They're still going strong, thanks to what wonder, what wonderful people at Virgin. Um, but we may never have taken off if, if, that, if that picture had appeared all over the newspapers. And the reason I wanted to start with that clip and the reason why I enjoyed it so much when listening to the book is I think it, it speaks to something that people just don't talk about often enough, which is luck. Everybody wants to tell you they're a great strategist or a wonderful leader or a hirer of amazing people, but would you be sitting here having this conversation with me if luck hadn't been a big part of your life? I just couldn't agree with you more. I think... Um, uh, I, I often think that I'm, I've, I've been born under a lucky star. When I was reading my, my, the Losing and Finding My Virginity book, um, my life story, I, I, um, there were moments I just said, said out loud, this guy is certifiably mad. What on earth made him 
you know, having nearly died on the Atlantic, get, get into a hot air balloon and do the Pacific or, you know, then, then go around the world in, in a balloon. Um, uh, it made for gripping, gripping stories, but, um, but every single time something dramatically went wrong and somehow somebody was kind enough to guide, guide us home um, by hook or by crook. So luck, I think, I, I, you know, I think there are lots of people who work just as hard as I've worked or just as hard as you've worked um, uh, who haven't had those lucky breaks. Um, and, um, and, you know, you can, you can, you, you know, if you keep, keep trying and keep trying, keep trying, you may, may get those lucky breaks, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and um, so, yeah, definitely luck, pay, luck plays a big part in, um, in survival and, um, uh, and in uh, you know, built, becoming an entrepreneur. There's a, there's a lady called Dr. Susan Albers who's done a lot of research into luck. And her findings are that optimistic people are luckier. Optimistic leaders get more luck. What do you think of that? I think that's almost definitely true. Um, I mean, I'm a born optimist. I always look at the uh, positive side of anything and everybody. Um, uh, I will always look for the best in people. If, if there's somebody who works for Virgin, I will never criticize, you know, always praise, um, you know, always look for, for what, what they've done in a positive way. If they've done something which is, um, you know, um, which, I, which I'm not happy with, um, they don't need to be told. They'll know, they'll know that they've, they, you know, that they've messed up or something and they'll make sure they don't do it again. So, so I think, I think just general optimism is, um, uh, is, is, a, is a really positive trait. And I think we'll, you're much more likely to, to get, for, get your, your, fulfill your dreams if you, if you um, look for the positive in everything. Where do you think it came from in you, the optimism? I suspect my mum. I mean, she um, uh, she tried everything um, in a really positive way. Um, you know, if she if she wasn't allowed to become a gliding pilot in the in the in the war, um, she would dress up as a man to become a you know a gliding pilot. You know, she would try everything, and we we would run to keep up with her. And um, she always looked in the positive side of, of, of us. I remember, I remember if, if we ever said ill about anybody, um, myself or my sisters, um, we were sent to the, the mirror and we had to look at the mirror for 10 minutes um, because she said it reflected so badly on us. They just taught, taught us, you know, to, to, we didn't like looking at ourselves for 10 minutes and taught us to, um, yeah, to, to, look, to, to look for the best in everybody. And, and interestingly, when you do look for the best in everybody, you'll find that most people, you know, there's, there's, there's very few negatives about most people. I mean, it's, um, I mean, I, I was um, playing tennis in Morocco with, with, the, with this gentleman who was a very good tennis player. And afterwards I said, come and have lunch. And he said, you know, I don't think you'll want to have lunch with me, Richard. So I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, well, I'm the, the son of the Koch brothers. Now that the Koch brother uh, and, and I, responded to him and said, well, look, I know your uncle and father are more right wing than Genghis Khan. Um, but, um, and, and I know my politics are more on, on, on left of center, but don't, don't be stupid. Let's, let's sit down and have lunch. So we, we sat down and had lunch and uh, we got out a piece of paper and we wrote down, um, the 25 issues of the world. Um, and we found that on, you know, 22 of the 25, we agreed. Um, and there were three that we disagreed on. And, um, and yet, we're, our politics are completely opposite, and 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 um, and, th and then we agreed that let's work together with our foundations on the ones we agreed on. But the, the, you know, the point of the story is that most people, when you actually, you know, when when you when you get when you really get to know people, um, uh, the, the difference between people is much less than people think, um, which is, um, and, and 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 I wish with with the, all the extreme politics that are going on, people could realize that. Hey everyone, I just want to talk to you very briefly about what I believe to be a total revolution in sleep, and it's called Eight Sleep. It's a pod cover that goes on the mattress that's currently on your bed, and it controls the temperature 
to suit you perfectly. And it all works from this app. Me and my wife, we like different temperatures. I actually like my side of the bed cooler. But the Eight Sleep isn't just about the temperature. It's your own personal sleep coach. So just look at the information that I wake up to. I get a sleep fitness score. I can find out more about the quality of my sleep, the kind of routine that I'm in. But it also gives me the different sleep stages as well. So I can find out how much REM sleep or deep sleep I'm getting. And then I can tailor things in my own life, like alcohol or coffee before bed or when I work out to try and improve my sleep. And we all know that sleep is the foundation of high performance. If we can improve our sleep, we can improve so much of our life. It's time to bring tech to the bedroom by going to 8sleep.com forward slash HPP, where you can get 200 pounds off your pod and free shipping. That's 8sleep.com forward slash HPP. Tell me what you think of of the discourse that's around at the moment, this idea that you have to be on one side of the fence or the other, this kind of black or white lack of nuance. Well, I think it. I think it's. I think it's very sad. And and um, I mean, I would say that um, uh, 80, 85, 80 percent of most people are, you know, are, are in the middle, and um, people are just saying extreme things in order to, you know, get the headlines and. Um, uh, but you know, most people want sensible, you know, sensible policies with you know with, with some with people running them who make sensible decisions, um, and um, you know they don't want the 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 extremes on the left or the extremes on the right, and and so it's been a pity the way that the way the way the world has uh, has pivoted, um, and I think a lot of that may be just down, down to you know TV and. Um, you know, t- TV and newspapers needing, you know, g- good extreme stories. And it isn't, it isn't even just politics, is it? You know, when I was, when I was listening to the book, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges for you and for all of us was the coronavirus pandemic. And you listen to your book and you're there, you're selling large swathes of, of your Virgin Galactic business to save people's jobs so that they can carry on feeding their kids and pay their mortgage, yet at the same time facing huge sort of criticism personally. And I just wonder, you know, how how that felt actually, because it it feels to me unfair. And I, you were in the eye of the storm. I don't know how you felt. It was, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it was a t- it was it was a really tough period f- for everybody. Um, but it, but um, uh, but um, I mean, but obviously, running Virgin, we were we were in the airline business. We just launched two cruise ships. Um, you know. Fitness clubs, hotel, every, everything was closed, and um, uh, and um, and you know, uh, British Airways, I think, thought they could get rid of us finally, um, and um, and they they came very very close because every other airline in the world, um, as went as a group to their governments, and they got you know loans from the government, or at least they got backup loans from the governments, yeah. guarantees, and. Um, British Airways said they didn't need it, and um, uh, and so we had to get very expensive money to 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 uh, keep Virgin going. And then the second we got it, they then got massive loans from the government, and um, and some somehow managed to you know um, you know pull a blinder on us basically. But anyway, we survived. That's the main thing. I you know flew in on Virgin Atlantic yesterday, and. Um, uh, it was as delightful as it was 40 years ago. The staff were as delightful as ever, and it's a great airline. And it was definitely, you know, definitely, um, you know, one, um, I'm so 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 pleased that we got we got we got through. You know, and the, cr- the cruise companies going strong, and everything's you know building back up again. And have you kind of have you built your armor over the years? Because I read this great quote that reminded me of you the other day when I was preparing for this interview, and it said, you can always spot the pioneer because they're the ones with arrows in their back. Does it, has it felt like that at times over the years, do you feel? Do you know, ge- generally speaking, I would say um, that, uh, that, I, that I've had um, a kind, kind press over the years. Um, I mean, there was, um, I've, you know, British Airways, have always been a thorn and a, you know an arrow in our back, mm-hmm. and and any time they feel they can uh, push us, uh, you know, get rid of us, they'll 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 do everything they can can to do that. The few times we've had negative press is is you know quite often been inspired by them to um, yeah to to 
you know, get rid of us. And um, I mean, there's a feature film called, um, I think, Hot Air or Dirty Tricks coming out, uh, being made at the moment about the Dirty Tricks campaign that British Airways launched to try to um, ber berid themselves of Virgin. Um, and, you know, what was extraordinary about that Dirty Tricks campaign was we only had four planes and yet the lengths they went to get rid of us um, uh, from, uh, you know, going through my rubbish bins, going through, you know, having setting up a unit to illegally access our computer information, um, uh, you know, to, you know, spreading malicious stories in the press and, and, and so on and so on. It was, it, 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 it you know, trying to bring up our passengers and uh, pretending to be from Virgin when they were actually British Airways staff, um, switch, you know, telling them that Virgin flights were cancelled and then switch, switch, you know, saying, but don't worry, we can switch you to British Airways. And so it was definitely the, 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 the British, was, they were definitely not, <laughs> they were definitely not British as, as, um, as, as one knows. And, and um, so those punches below the belt um, hurt. Um, on, on that occasion, we won the, the biggest libel damages in history and uh, uh, from British Airways, and we, we managed to get it out into the open and, um, and, and, and we got through that one. And, um, uh, and with COVID, we just en ended up saying, right, we will survive somehow. And, and Virgin Atlantic has survived. We've obviously got very expensive debt, which we've got to pay off, which, which they don't have. Um, so the playing field is change but um but we'll 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 get there so let's talk about the importance of resilience then we have a lot of entrepreneurs business owners self-starters that listen to high performance what would you tell them about the importance of resilience after the life you've lived and the challenges you've faced and overcome so i think when when you're setting up a new company um protecting the downside uh is very important. So, you know, like um, with your first company, it's not always easy to protect the downside. So I must admit, you know, I, I would mortgage ev everything with, with, with my first my first ventures. So, you know, uh, I mean, oh, you know, the houseboat, you know, I would, I would say to Joan, my, my, my girlfriend at the time, can you just sign here? You know, to, um, don't, don't worry about it. So when you're building up your first business, it's, it's you're, in, you're almost in those days, there was no such thing as venture capitalists or people you could go and get money. So, you know, everything, you somehow had to generate your own way of creating your business. And, and um, but once we'd gone from, you know, building a record company and, and, uh, and you know, it was now, it was now um, the most successful independent record label in the world. We just signed the Rolling Stones and Janet Jackson and so on. And, we, and I decided... Yeah, the airline business is shite, and I'm sure that we can do it better. And but I couldn't be sure that it would succeed, um, and I couldn't be sure that other people would agree with me. So the, the the key was in the negotiation with Boeing for the plane was the right to hand it back to them at the end of the first twelve months um, if um, if it didn't work out. And uh, and Boeing agreed to that. So I could then say to the, the team, the, the other teams at the record company, look, we're not going to put you out of business if the airline doesn't work. We can hand the plane back. Um, uh, you know, it gives, it gives me 12 months to prove that, you know, we, we can create a great airline. And as it turned out, at the end of the first 12 months, it, it, um, everybody loved Virgin Atlantic. And we got another couple of planes from Boeing. Um, but... We, we, the downside of being protected. And, and ever, ever since then, any new business I do, I look at ways of um, protecting against absolute disaster. So, um, you know, so Virgin, the group, we still own 100% of, um, uh, and then we have subsidiary companies. Um, and so, you know, when, when we're going into space, you know, it's a standalone subsidiary company se separate from um the, the group and and um you know virgin trains was a separate company and um and so we can then bring other shareholders into those companies and if if god forbid anything went re really wrong with any one individual company it's not going to bring the rest of the group crashing down yeah well let's let's talk about that then because i want to play this clip from your book you're a megalomaniac richard simon said We've been friends since we were teenagers, but if you do this, I'm not sure that we can carry on working together. What I'm telling you is that you go ahead with this 
over my dead body. So that actually is the reaction, isn't it, to you saying you wanted to set up an airline? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was universal <laughs> um, within within Virgin and um, uh, and outside. Um, and even uh, you know, Lord King, who had headed British Airways, said, um, uh, "Too old to rock and roll, too young to fly. You know, you'll never succeed." Basically, and you know, I owned 100 percent of the company. I, I'm not really interested in making money. I'm interested in creating things, and that's always been my my, my reason for being so the idea of you know creating the best airline in the world um uh you know was something that excited me um I've, i i felt i felt was needed i mean in those days you know if you flew on british airways or twa or pan am you know you were luck, lucky to have a lump of chicken dumped in your lap you had, there was no entertainment um the, you know, there was old planes the crew obviously were thoroughly unhappy working there and um, and there was no, you know, no redeeming good factors about them whatsoever. So, you know, that was perfect, perfect for us to come in with something fresh and then exciting. And, um, and, that, and, and that's what, you know, what we've tried to do throughout my life is create, create things we can be really proud of and uh, not get the accountants in, because if, if you get the accountants in, you know, they're going to tell you why you shouldn't do it. And just, but my, my, my feeling is that if you create something that is, exceptional that more money will come in in the year than go out and then and then the accountants can add up the money at the end of the year and hopefully they'll tell you that more money's come in than gone out and and, and then um you can you can go on to the next year and um and i'm a great believer in just um you know just saying screw it let's try it i mean as i was walking in somebody was telling me that um, a friend of theirs called rowan gormley um you know many 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 years ago um, was in a, in a in a meeting with me, and um, they were talking about. You know, he said, "Well, why, why don't we do financial services?" And everybody in the room looked at him and went, well, "You know, why on earth would Virgin be in financial services?" And um, uh, and then Rowan said, "Because it's a, you know, because it's um, you know, it's a it's a it's a dreadfully dreadful industry. They try to rip you off. Um, you know, it, it would be ripe for Virgin to go in and shake it up and." And I went, yeah, let's do it. And Rowan went, what do you mean, let's do it? I went, I said, yeah, let's start it. You're, you're, you're now managing director of, um, you know, Virgin Financial Services. So go, go ahead and do it. And, and, and that's what he did. And, and, um, uh, and many years later, um, yeah, Virgin Money grew and, and, and it's been very successful. So I think, you know, just, just um, that, that, that screw it, let's do it mentality is very important. And it plays into the idea of exploration. Let's listen to this. I've always lived my life by thriving on opportunity and adventure. And some of the best ideas come out of the blue and you have to keep an open mind to see their virtue. Just as an American lawyer called me to suggest setting up an airline in 1984, a Swedish ballooning fanatic asked me to fly across the Atlantic with him in 1987. The proposals come in thick and fast and I have no idea what the next one will be. I do, however, know that if I listen carefully enough, the good ideas somehow all fit into the framework that Virgin has become. So if I listen carefully enough, a good idea will fit into the framework that Virgin has become. So what are you listening for? Well, on that occasion, you know, we didn't have the internet. Um, we, uh, we were building um, what, what we hoped would become the most respected brand in the world. And, um, and, uh, and I had to use myself uh, to uh, put the Virgin brand on the map. So... Um, so if somebody came to me and said, no one's crossed the Atlantic in a hot air balloon before, you know, my brain would have said, mm, we could have quite a big virgin sign on the side of that balloon. Um, it'll be fun to go and learn to become a ballooning pilot. Um, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I should give it a go. And then I remember saying to him, are you married? Do you have children? And he said, yes. So I thought, well, he's not. He's not. He obviously doesn't want to commit suicide. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, um, yeah, let's take it the next step. And then, um, and then a couple of weeks later, I find myself in Spain, um, get, getting my ballooning license, and um, and start, the start of extraordinary adventures um, that um, uh, had many, many, many ups and and, and many downs. Indeed. Um, 
including bouncing across the ocean, which was one of the ups and downs. Um, what really intrigued me when I listened to that, because you know, just being involved in high performance, Richard, just uses up all my spare time, all my mental capacity. I feel kind of at the edge all the time. Yet you were running all these businesses, involved in all these companies, doing all these amazing things, and still found the time to get your pilot's license for ballooning, go and do these amazing challenges with Pear, hop on a speedboat and race across the world. How did you find the time to, to do the, the things you were doing aside from just sitting in an office and running the businesses? Being dyslexic, um, I learned very early on the art of delegation. Now, I, I would say to anybody who's do, doing anything in life, um, and particularly running businesses or building businesses, uh, whether you're dyslexic or not, you, you must learn the art of delegation. You must realize that you can't do everything yourself. You must really run, run your companies as if you're, you've been run over um, the next day and, and that you've got, <clears throat> you've got f a fantastic team of people to run the day-to-day -day running of it. I'm a great believer in you know, g getting a company set up and then you know, two or three months later, you, you leave the building um, you put somebody else in charge. Um, I went, used to go back to my houseboat. Um, uh, if, if there's somebody else in charge in the building, um, then a lot of their time is going to be spent. People always want to see the top person in the company, uh, just, you know, being polite to people, um, you know, doing do, a lot of time, to, time is wasted, to, um, being the top person. Whereas you now, are out of the building and, and you can start thinking about the bigger pictures and, and, um, and, and, um, and you know, move, move into the next, next venture or, in, you know, or, or jumping in when, when there's firefighting that really needs you to fix it or, um, you know, jumping into, um, uh, yeah, to, 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 you know, to put, to put the company on the map. You know, unfortunately, I think I, I've managed to surround myself with great people over the years. How do you find great people? I would say that the generally the best people that one finds are from within the company, um, and uh, bringing in the so-called experts from outside, um, people often make big mistakes. Um, and if you're ca not careful, you can actually ruin a company by bringing somebody in at the top who's not imbued imbued with the. Um, philosophy of your company and the general atmosphere of the company. Did um, you learn that by making that mistake? Uh, we certainly made that mistake on occasions, um, but, um, uh, you know, at, 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 on Necker Island, um, uh, there, there was a, a you know, before I lived there full time, there was a management change and um, they brought some, a couple in from outside and, um, and you know they they, they said to the, the the staff that you can't drink with the guests. I mean, um, you know, they, 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 they um, you know they they talk. I don't know. They started making putting rules in, which was was just so so antiquated, and and uh, and you know we had to do something quickly about it, and 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 we actually changed that couple. But um, you know, but um, so by and large, if you if within a company. There are quite often people that you don't actually realize um, are capable of more than they are because they are the receptionist or because they are um, doing something. You just, you, your, your brain pictures them doing that. But if you give them that chance to do something, um, something more, they, they are, and they'll often be so grateful that they, they will actually surprise, surprise you. And um, will excel, will excel at at, at a, you know, a bigger appointment. So, what would you advise for our audience who might always go outside to find the, the next appointment? What would you advise they they ask of the people in the business? How do they go about working out if someone that's doing a certain role in the business is capable of of more responsibility of a greater role? So, I think I think it, the people who are running a company should know uh, know all their people well um and uh you know they i mean like they, by you know, they should go out to the pub together um they, they they um uh you know should let their hair down with with with, with the people who who work who work with them and you know especially when the company is relatively small they they they, they should know you know which people 
um, have got have got capabilities that are more than uh, 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 more more than it, more than they currently have, um, and um, uh, and as a leader, you know, I've you know, I think it, it's very important that you know if you if you have a staff party, you know, you're the first into the swimming pool fully dressed so that everybody else can come in and have a good time. You're the first to be dancing on the table, make sure that it's a strong table. Um, on NECA, all our tables are built for dancing, um, uh, so it doesn't collapse under you and you you, you look a real fool. Um, <laughs> but um, And what does that do for people? It, it, it gives them the permission to let their hair down and have a, have a great night. There are parties where you, you see the directors sitting with their ties and their suits in the corner of the room sipping, sipping champagne and, and everybody else feels that they they must stand around sipping sh- sipping sherry or champagne and and um uh uh and everybody has a pretty dull night so i'm just trying to illustrate that um uh that you know people are human are human beings and um you know you you should um the people you work with should be you know could you know, think of them as your um your nephews, your nieces, your children, your, your, you know, and and your 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 friends, yeah. and and um, and and just make them feel completely at home in in in, in the company that they're working for, you know. I mean, with Virgin Atlantic, I, when, when when we took off on that flight um, forty years ago, I remember looking around at the staff and thinking, you know, they're so vibrant, they're so fantastic, you know. Can we keep that, you know, in three years? Five years, six years, let alone did I ever think forty years. Um, but on a Virgin Atlantic flight today, it, it's it, they, they've still got that same spirit that they had um, forty years ago, and um, and that's by um, us never having, you know, somebody man- managing the company that suddenly brings in archaic rules that that um, destroys, you know, destroys that um, joie de vie. So. How do you then get out of their way to allow them to thrive? Because you're Richard Branson, you're the face of Virgin. Everyone would imagine that you're involved in every every possible decision. So we've got a lot of companies, and I'm obviously not involved in every decision. And as the ultimate leader, uh, uh, you've got to let people make mistakes, and 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 you've got to let let people make good things, and you mustn't second um, second guess every move they make. Um, uh, and if they do make a mistake. Um, you, you you mustn't criticize them for it. I mean, you just got to you, you know accept that mistakes get made, and that you you make you if you were running it, you'd make mistakes too, um, and just hope that they make more you know more more positive things than negative things. And then ultimately, obviously, if it's a, a whole series of negative things, then you, you you do need to get somebody different to run the company. But by and large, that that that. You know, but by by and large, that should happen very, very seldomly. I think, if, especially if you promote it from within, you you know their capabilities before you've promoted them. And how quickly do you make your mind up about someone? Are you are you are you decisive? So, uh, if you'd asked me this forty years ago, I would have said, um, I, I I can uh, I'll make make up my mind about somebody within the first two minutes of, of meeting them. I, I've learned over the years how wrong I was and. You know, and um, how uh, you know how you know people I might have first thought you know thought um, you know slightly negatively about can can turn in turn out to be the most wonderful people and and it's just it just took getting to getting to know them to realize that so so I think you got one's got to be careful I mean obviously if you're busy 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 you you're, you're you're having to make quick decisions but you've got to be careful about judging people. Too quickly, and and it's important to really, um, you know, get to know people. Which plays nicely into this clip from your from your new book. You should be great listeners, for there is a lot to learn. You should roll up your sleeves, have fun, and try out everything, and in time, hopefully, become capable of being leaders of people too. The way to become a great leader is to look for the best in people. Seldom criticize, always praise. So that's advice you were leaving to your children. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I think um, and and grandchildren now. <laughs> so yes, um, they. Um, yeah, I think it's important. I think I think it's important, um, and um, it's a much much happier life to to run to to run your life like that, um, both for yourself and and for the people concerned. 
Um, uh, it, it, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to repeat what I said earlier, but it just there's, there's mm-hmm. just no point in um, uh, you know criticizing somebody who knows you know knows they've made a mistake. What, what's the point in them hearing it from their, their boss? And 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 the worst still is if you know if you as the leader criticize somebody that, that it it's emphasized in it you know times 10 because you know you're 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 the, you're the leader um and um so it's it's much more much more painful yeah. um and were you were you like this right from day one when you set up virgin records or have you learned over the years i th- i think i i think i was like that from a very young age um and i do think that my dyslexia helped because um you know when when i was young um i was the youngest you know so you know i was 15 16 i had people working with me who were 17 18 19 i was learning myself and um uh and you know most likely they were more capable than me anyway so so uh so it, it, that that taught me you know taught me to be uh yeah taught me to be um what's the word for it uh yeah yeah taught me to be kind i suppose yeah. Because you 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 talk about dyslexia really being a superpower. Mm-hmm. Could you explain that for us? Well, I think I think um, uh, it, it's it, it can be painful at school, but in, in in when I was at school, they didn't know what dyslexia was. So I was just thought of as thick. Um, the the good thing about being dyslexic, if you can be encouraged to excel at the things you in, you you enjoy and you're good at. Um, and not worry too much about the things you're not good at. Um, but, but because there are some things you're not good at, you're going to excel really, potentially really well at the things that you're good at. And, and so con- concentrate on those and then, you know, delegate or find other people to help you with the things that you're not, you're not good at. And that's, that's exactly what I did. If I hadn't been dyslexic, I would have stayed in, stayed in school till I was, and then gone to university and and um, not you know not not done this sort of slightly more taken the more unconventional path that I took. One of the other things you talk about often is is the importance of writing things down using your notebooks. Let's listen to this. My most essential possession is a standard size school notebook, which can be bought at any stationery shop on any high street. I carry this everywhere, and I write down all the comments that are made to me by version staff and anyone else I meet. I make notes of all telephone conversations and all meetings, and I draft out letters and lists of telephone calls to make. Over the years, I've worked my way through a bookcase of them, and the discipline of writing everything down ensures that I have to listen to people carefully. It feels like a, a very simple superpower of yours, this, this idea of constantly making notes, making lists, ticking them off, reminding yourself of things. Yeah, I've, I think that I, I've seen leaders... Um, uh, walk around their companies uh, and talk to their staff and um, talk to their customers and not write things down. And um, and I suspect, you know, in you know, one, one day they most likely will have had twenty or thirty different little ideas, some big ideas. They'll only remember maybe one or two uh, by the end of the day. You almost wonder whether they feel it's demeaning for them to be writing things down slightly unhip. Um, uh, by writing things down, you can make sure that you 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 get back, you you deal if a, if a, if a, if a staff member has an issue with something, um, you, you you don't have to do it yourself, but you can you know send a note, de- delegate it, get 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 it dealt with, and um, uh, and. They will forever be grateful, but the, but more importantly, most likely that issue is an issue that all your staff members have uh, have. So that's that that sorted it out for everybody. And um, and in time, you end up with uh, you, know, you know, like on, let's say with Virgin Atlantic. I mean, I've you know um, every single time I've t- taken a flight, and you know, from forty years back to now, I've a- always had the notebook with me, um, and. You know, like on one of the very, very first flights, I met um, somebody who'd come from Israel, who was flying to New York, and and um, and he said, uh, you know, Richard, if you if you had the best kosher food on board, um, there are a whole group of us who fly regularly to and from New York, and we would only fly Virgin Atlantic because nobody else has good kosher food, 
Um, and, you know, when I got back, I made absolutely certain that we had the best kosher food on board. Um, and, you know, 40 years on, uh, you know, this, that, that we, we, we have, I don't know, 50, 100 people on board who are, you know, always flying us because they know that we've got good kosher food. I mean, that's just one of thousands of little things that you, you, you just tick, tick the box and, um, and, it, and, it can, and it can make the difference between uh, a company surviving or not. But it, but it, it, but it also makes for a, an exceptional airline or an exceptional train company or exceptional cruise company rather than just a, an average company. And, and um, so I think and, and lead, lead, leaders should be doing this all the time. Because I think a lot of people believe that leaders are the ones that have to answer questions. But it sounds like you're saying the most important thing as a leader you can do is ask questions. Oh, yes. I mean, I think uh, um, ask, asking questions and then and, and just listening to, to que- you know, listening is, is important. I mean, I, I know what I think. So hearing my voice is not going to improve anything at Virgin. Um, uh, but hearing, listening to what other people think, um, uh, you know, th- th- is, 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 is can make a massive difference. And, you know, the people who really know uh, what's going on? I mean, again, going back to say Virgin Atlantic, the people who, uh, you know, who are in, know what's going on are the people in the front lines. Um, you know, our, uh, our cabin crew, our pilots, um, uh, our engineers. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I remember one of our engineers once said to me, "If if all the planes had names, you know, like Scarlet Lady or Maiden Voyager, or um, I don't think we'd be, maintain them any better." Uh, than just having you know 0085 you know on the side of the plane, but but I think we would we we would we we would sort of treat them um, yeah we actually I think I think even we might even be able to we might even you know we might even find we, we engineer them better because people can say you know maiden voyager oh my god it's had that same problem again uh, but, you know and uh, uh, scarlet lady um, you know oh, she, she's been playing up with such and such. And and you you start you start thinking of the planes as hum, as humans rather yeah. than um, just uh, neb, nebulous numbers um, and um, yeah so we we introduce, we, we introduce names for all the planes and all our ships and uh, all our trains and and, um, and they became more more human as a result. Let's move from planes to helicopters because uh, this had me laughing out loud when I listened. The next thing I knew, the imposing structure of Sydney Harbour Bridge was approaching fast in front of me. I tried dropping my arms as I just taught myself, but it wasn't going to be enough. I tried shouting to the helicopter pilot to climb higher, but that was just as futile. There was no way he could hear me. Higher, higher, I shouted. I'm going to hit the bridge. I was sure of it. What a way to go, I thought, zooming across the sky in a harness before splat a face-first collision with one of Australia's most iconic constructions. I almost lost count of the times, <laughs> listening to the book, that you nearly ended things for good, and that, that feels like one of them. But, um, yeah, I, I'd arrived in Australia, and instead of uh, to launch Virgin Mobile, and um, instead of going into Australia, they took me out to a field outside um, Sydney, and... Um, uh, they hadn't briefed me. They told me to lie on the grass. They attached a harness to me, um, a bungee jump um, about 200 feet ab- above me, and then the helicopter took off, and um, and I took off heading into uh, Sydney, 200 foot below, dangling below this helicopter. And initially, I started spinning around, and then I managed to get into a skydive position. And then it was just wonderful. I just felt like a bird flying. I mean, if I drop my arm slightly to the left, I go to the left. I drop my arm slightly to the right, I go to the right. And it was it was something I would highly recommend anybody dangle two hundred foot below a helicopter and and and, uh, yeah, and and feel like a bird. Um, but then, as as I said in the book, uh, the bridge started looming up. Well, fortunately, they did actually uh, pull up the helicopter. Did you honestly think that was going to be it? I. Uh, hopefully assumed that uh, they they would they would pull up, um, but um, but but I definitely I, I could see the faces of the people walking across the bridge, wow. um, 
Uh, I think there were more more hairy moments in my life than that. Um, but, but that was the, the, but it, but um, uh, but we then landed the other side and and uh, uh, on these cages where all these people who had contracts signed to Orange and uh, other other mobile cell net and other mobile phone companies and I gallantly released 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 them all and um, uh, and then we launched Virgin Mobile. But um, I think almost every um, everything I've Every new venture we've done in in my life, we've I, I've, people just assume that I'm going to do some massive stunt to put it on the map, and um, assume that I w- I won't say no, and uh, and I've generally generally speaking enjoyed all of them. Why didn't you say, ever say no? The one I should have said no to uh, was in Vegas when when we uh, flew in um, from. Um, uh, we started a, a service from LA to Vegas, and they they, we, they, we, they took me to the Palm Hotel. It was about a fifty mile an hour wind that was blowing. Uh, they still hadn't told me what I was doing. Um, then, as we went into the hotel, they said um, I, I could see all these people gathered outside the hotel for a party. They said, um, uh, "Richard, we, we're going to pop up to the top floor uh, to the roof, and you're going to jump uh, into into this crowd at the bottom." And you're going to make your great your grand entrance that way. And as we were going up the lift, I thought something something doesn't feel right. Um, the, the wind the wind is very strong. I, don't, I, I had a stunt man that used to um, or, or used to come and help me with these things. He hadn't been you know he hadn't checked it. Um, and uh, and I tried to. Delay it, and then they said, "Well, look, no, look, just come up to the roof, and um, you know, we just do the photographs with the press on the roof. Um, we we'll completely understand if you don't want to do it." And I knew that when I got to the roof, I, I wouldn't be able to say no. So we, we get to the roof. They said, "You know, well, look, there's no wind. I mean, there wasn't any wind because it, there was a six-foot wall around the roof." And then I, I screw it, let's do it. Mentality took over, and the next moment, I'm jumping. And I'm going down 100 miles an hour down the side of the building, and I hit the, hit the um, side of the building with my ass um, uh, halfway down, and um, and I end up at the bottom like a rag doll with blood just pouring down my legs uh-huh. uh, from a very naked naked bruised butt. And um, uh, but at least I didn't didn't spin around. Um, so that was one that I definitely should have said no to. <laughs> you should have done. But on the flip side, these stunts worked miraculously well for setting the tone of Virgin, for yeah. sharing the brand. I think the, I'd love to know where the idea came from and why they were so powerful. But also, I was intrigued by the fact that these stunts seem to rattle your competitors so often. Yeah, I think, I think um, British Airways... Um, uh, we were, we, you know, we, we were very much the David versus the Goliath, and um, uh, and but the way they treated us, it was as if they were taking on a, a t- taking on a Goliath, and and they were definitely worried that we would become, a, a, you know, we would grow to the extent that we have actually, I think, grown, um, and um, so they were trying to snuff us out early on. Um, uh, we didn't have a big advertising budget, so if British Airways. Uh, Stumbled, we would we would we would have a bit of fun at their expense. So um, there were, there was an occasion that um, th- they were sponsoring the London Wheel um, opp- opposite the House of Commons, and the wheel was lying on the ground. And they invited all the press there to see the wheel being um, being, being being pulled up. And um, I got a call at six in the morning, and and I was told they had a technical problem. Um, and um, we happened to have a little airship company. And um, so I rang up the head of the airship company and uh, scrambled the airship. And uh, the airship flew over all the TV and all the press uh, and this wheel that was lying flat on the ground. And, and the side of the airship simply said, BA can't get it up. Um, and we got the headlines. <laughs> and and, and uh, even although they did get it up later that day, um, uh, they, they, their story was a non-story. So, um, yeah, so we did we did pull their tail uh, on occasions. <laughs> and and um, uh, uh, but but um, uh, but I think 
you know, it made people smile. And I think, I think, I think a lot of the, with, with anything like stunts or anything, it, it's really important to make people smile. People have got to, in, you know, in, enjoy what you're doing. It mustn't feel like a stunt. It's got, it's got to be, uh, it's, it, it, you know, the, the more humor you can have, the better. Um, I mean, on another occasion, you know, I love April Fool's Day and every, every April Fool's, I will do something fairly major. Um, and, um, and we, we, we took off uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning in a UFO. And um, we uh, flew over um, London. Uh, and, um, uh, and it was a, a real UFO. So there was, you know, like anybody who looked up, it was, there was no question it was a UFO. And um, panic broke out, and um, and um, uh, the radio, all the radio stations took up. The 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 police were called. Um, the army were called out. Um, uh, all everybody stopped down the motorway um, and um, came out and um, were watching, looking up. And um, and then we landed in this foggy field outside Gatwick, and they surrounded the field. Um, and just like an ET, we had this door that very slowly came down um, and then we had this little ET figure that was on board who w walked down the steps and this policeman who'd come with his truncheon um, just ra ran around in the opposite direction and uh, when I came out we got arrested for wasting wasting the army and the police time but um, by the end of the day they found that they, they saw the funny side of it and they, they let, let us go so <laughs> um, it, it plays into this all human beings are born as entrepreneurs, but unfortunately, many of us never had the opportunity to unwrap that part of our life, so it remains hidden. Now, as you do have the opportunity, don't waste it. I think entrepreneurship is our natural state, a big adult word that probably boils down to something much more obvious, like playfulness. And we've spoken a lot in this conversation, we're nearly out of time, about the importance of playfulness, the fun that you've had along the way. I'm really interested in what you say at the start there, that entrepreneurship is in all of us. What would you like to leave people thinking about regarding entrepreneurship and the opportunities that are in front of them? So I think, I think it's worth remembering that, um, well, let me just go back. I mean, when, I, when I started out um, in Britain, there was Anita Roddick, who was a female entrepreneur, and there was myself, and there were no other entrepreneurs. I mean, it was... Um, the word entrepreneur, I don't even think it ex existed. I mean, bizarrely, it existed in France where there weren't any at all But um, in, in those days. But, you know, you had British Airways, British Gas, British Steel, British Coal, British Rail, um, et cetera, et cetera, British Telecom, all, all owned by government. And, um, and, not, and, and they were all abysmally run um, and miserable to work for. And then entrepreneurism got born. And... Um, and entrepreneurs are, you know, I'm biased, but I, you know, entrepreneurs are what is fixing the world. I mean, entrepreneurs are improving other people's lives in every single different area. And, um, and entrepreneurs, you know, if climate change is going to be fixed, it'll be through entrepreneurism. I mean, with, with government setting the right, the, the right, the right boundaries, et cetera. Um, but on, on, entrepreneurism will, will, entrepreneurs will fix um, cancer, they'll fix health, they'll fix, um, they'll, they'll fix, you know, pretty well, pretty well everything you can think of. And, you know, what is a business? A business is simply somebody coming up with an idea to make other people's lives better. That's, that's all it is. And if you can come up with an idea to make other people's lives better, possibly through frustration, your own frustration with, with them, something you think, you know, I'm fr frustrated by why do they do it that way? And then you should say, okay, I, I should do it myself. I can do it better than they're doing it. Uh, and if you can have a, you know, that screw it, let's do it mentality, just, you know, just try, try things, try, you know, keep trying things. And then, um, and then ultimately, you know, something will stick, something will work. And then once you've done, once you've been able to build one entrepreneurial company, you can, you can build any, any numbers of entrepreneurial companies. Um, you also need to remember that companies is just all about people. I mean, if you, you know, find, find really good people who believe in your idea, um, and give them the freedom to go and, uh, um, and go and, um, uh, excel and you hopefully will have, have a really successful, um, a successful company and, um, be, you know, be proud of what you're doing. 
Brilliant. Right, we're going to finish with some quickfire questions, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. What do you believe are the three most important behaviours for, for any business person? Absolutely. Surrounding themselves with great people. Um, um, uh, uh, believing in what, believing 100% in what they're doing. Um, uh, and um, because, they, because they believe in what they're doing, they, they um, will work day and night to, um, you know, to, to put the company or, um, or the project on the map and make it succeed. What advice would you give to a, a teenage Richard just starting out on this journey? Uh, screw it, just do it. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I think I mentioned it earlier, but just look, look, look for the best in everybody. Yeah. AI. Positive about the future with AI or worried about it? If I have to choose one or the other, positive. What lights you up at the moment? Uh, the ability to use, use my ability to be able to ring anybody in the world and get through to um, make positive change. There's three things that I want to share that Holly, your daughter, put onto social media and get an answer from you on. The first thing she said is you've taught her the importance of being present. Why does that matter so much? Um, I think, uh, you know, I think we, 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 we only have one life and, uh, and we, owe it to, we, we owe it to everybody in the room to, to, to be present and, and um, to give our all to whoever you're with at any one time and, and, um, uh, and not, not to be, yeah, not to be within oneself. <laughs> she said that you've taught her that the only thing to be scared of regarding dreams is if they're too small. Yeah, I think it's a waste of life to, to not dream big, so. And the other point she made is you've taught her the importance of childlike wonder. Um, I think we should, yeah, we should, be, we should always be um, dreaming and trying to make, make our dreams come true. Brilliant. And the final question after this really interesting hour that we've spoken for, what would you leave or like to leave ringing in the eyes and ears of our audience for them to live their own high performance life? Um, I think, I think just to spend your life um, do, doing uh, something that you can be proud of um, and um, yeah, and surrounding yourself with people who, um, uh, who can be proud of you and proud of what they're doing. Brilliant. Sounds like you've enjoyed the journey. Uh, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a long way from over yet. <laughs> thank you very much. Richard, thank you. Yeah, great. I Lovely really to see you. Yeah, well thank done. you. Thank you.